Chapter 51 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershit. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Revival of the Viking Spirit, Magnus Barefoot. When Olaf Kyrre died, his son Magnus was proclaimed king in Viken, while the people of Oplanen were led, as it appears, by Thore of Stieg, who chose his nephew Haakon. The arrangement of joint kingship, first introduced in the time of Magnus the Good and Harald Hardrada, was now repeated. The kingdom does not seem to have been divided, though some sources seem to indicate it. According to the Morkenskina, the two kings ruled together for two years, but the older sources, Theodricus Monicus and Augrip, state that the joint kingship lasted only one winter. Haakon was then killed by a fall from his horse. Thore of Steig, the old opponent of Olaf Kyrre, did not even now acknowledge King Magnus, though after the death of Haakon, the young king was the only legitimate heir to the throne. Thore formed an opposition party in support of the pretender Sven, and started a revolt. But this was easily put down, and the two leaders, Thore of Steig and Egil Oskelsen, were captured and executed. The king found another opponent in Sveinfis Steinersen, who was a lendermand, a sort of Mark Graf in the border districts on the Goethe River. In these far-off districts his will was law, and he protected the people against the robbers and outlaws who infested the region along the border. He had not taken part in the revolt, but he did not submit to the king, and managed all affairs according to his own mind. He was summoned to the Borger thing, where the Stalora, Sigurd Ulstring represented the king. After the thing was assembled, they saw a body of warriors approaching, dressed in steel so bright that they looked like a moving block of ice. This was Sveinke, who came to the thing with five hundred armed followers. He ridiculed the Stalera, and after some altercations Sigurd had to flee. The king marched against the arrogant Lendermand, but hostilities were averted through the intercession of friends. Sveinke was banished for a short period, but he was soon recalled and became one of the king's best friends. Magnus Barefoot was a warrior like his grandfather Harald Hardrada. In his reign the air was again filled with the sounds of war trumpets and the din of arms. The Viking spirit flared up anew from the smoldering embers, fanned into life by the martial spirit of the young king, who was reported to have said that a king ought to court honor rather than a long life. King Magnus was brave to foolhardiness, and energetic to rashness, a sort of demigod, who was loved by his followers even for his faults. But it would be manifestly unjust to regard him as a mere Viking chieftain, or as a romantic dreamer who spent the ten years of his reign in the pursuit of the phantom of military glory. It is evident that he followed a clearly conceived plan, and that he was never led by vain ambition to waste his means in rash and impossible adventures. He did not aspire to the throne of England, like his grandfather had done, nor did he attempt to conquer Ireland, as some old writers would have us believe. The chief, if not the only purpose of his expedition to the British Isles, seems to have been to reduce the Norse Island possessions to full submission to the home government. But the ever-recurring war expeditions increased the burdens of taxation, removed great numbers of the ablest men from productive employments, and retarded the peaceful development inaugurated by Olaf Kyrre. The history of Magnus Barefoot's reign is a record of his military campaigns, of the internal affairs of the country in his time little is known, of real progress history has nothing to record. As soon as Magnus was securely seated on the throne, he provoked a war with Sweden by claiming the Swedish province of Dahl, or Dalsland, lying between Ranrike and Lake Venern. He crossed the Goethe River with an army, and harried the districts until they had to offer their submission. On Colland Island, in Lake Venern, he built a fort and left a garrison of 360 men. But when he returned home for the winter, the Swedish king, Inge Stenkelsson, captured the fort and drove away the garrison. The following spring Magnus renewed his campaign, and a battle was fought at Foxerna, on the Gotha River. According to Algrip, Magnus was victorious, but according to Theodricus Monicus, he lost the battle. The last version is probably correct, since a peace conference was called at Konghella in 1101, where the three kings, Magnus Barefoot of Norway, Inge Stenkelson of Sweden, 
and Eric Eigod of Denmark were all present. According to the terms of the treaty here concluded, the king should retain the territories which their predecessors had held, but Magnus should receive the hand of Margaret, King Inge's daughter, in marriage, and her dowry should be the districts in dispute. She was nicknamed Fredkula, the Peace Maiden. Snorra gives the following description of the three kings as they appeared together at Konghella. Inge was the largest and strongest and looked most dignified. Magnus seemed the most valiant and energetic, but Eric was the handsomest. The most noteworthy features of King Magnus's reign were his expeditions to the British Isles. Two earlier expeditions, which Magnus was thought to have made in 1092 and 1093 to 1094, have been described by the old scholar Torfaeus. Buchanan, a Scotch historian of the 16th century, who bases his account on Fordun's Scotchetronicon, also tells how King Magnus in 1094 aided Prince Donald Bain to gain the throne of Scotland. The account of the last-named expedition has been considered to be historic also by the great Norwegian historian P. A. Munch, but Gustav Storm has shown that Magnus made neither of these expeditions. The passage in the Statutronicon is shown to be an interpolation by a late writer, and the foundation for the statement referring to Magnus's operations in Scotland in 1094 disappears wholly when it is made clear that at this time he was still in Norway, busily engaged in securing his succession to the throne. Norse sagas mention only the two expeditions in 1098 to 1099 and 1102 to 1103, about which Welsh chronicles, Irish annals, and verses of contemporary skalds give the most reliable information. After the peace at Konghella, Magnus sailed to the British Isles with a fleet of 150 ships. He landed in the Orkneys, where he deposed the Jarls Paul and Erland and sent them to Norway, possibly because they had been neglectful of their duties as vassals. Soon afterward, he took King Gudrud Kroen of the Hebrides prisoner and forced him to submit. He then proceeded to the Isle of Man, which was regarded by the Norsemen as belonging to the Hebrides group, Sudriar. Civil strife between rival chieftains had here been in progress, and he found on the battlefield of Sandvad the corpses still lying unburied, says the chronicle. He took possession of the island and erected a number of houses and castles. According to Ordericus Vitalis, he brought over a large number of colonists from Norway, because the inhabitants had been greatly reduced in numbers by the incessant feuds. The real reason for the new colonization may have been that he could put little trust in the loyalty of the Manx, who were partly of Gaelic descent, and who had lived isolated in their island homes too long to feel any attachment for Norway. During the reign of William Rufus, 1087-1100, the Normans in England were engaged in subduing Wales. The king was unsuccessful in his campaigns against the Welsh mountaineers, but Norman barons and adventurers had gradually pushed their way into the country, where they seized one district after the other and erected castles. When the king of South Wales fell in the Battle of Brecknock in 1093, three Norman lordships came into being in South Wales. In northern Wales, the Normans had been less successful, but the conquest was pressed with energy. The Earl of Chester had pulled across the Menai Strait to Anglesey, where he built a castle at Abrachaniog, but the Welsh rallied in 1095 to 1096 and destroyed all the Norman castles on Welsh soil except that of Pembroke. King William marched against them and vowed that he would exterminate the entire male population, but he had to return home without having won a single victory. The Norman earls were more successful. In 1098, the earls of Shrewsbury and Chester marched through northern Wales, crossed over to Anglesey, and rebuilt the castle of Aberchneniog. The Welsh turned to Magnus barefoot for aid. He accepted the invitation and quickly crossed over from the Isle of Man with his fleet. In attempting to prevent the Norsemen from landing, the Earl of Shrewsbury was mortally wounded, and the Normans, who had become thoroughly alarmed, evacuated Anglesey. Magnus returned to the Orkneys for the winter. King Logman of Man, whom he had taken captive, was made vassal king of Man in the Hebrides, and he seems to have ruled till 1101. When the king and his men returned to Norway, they wore Scotch national costumes. As these had never before been seen in Norway, they attracted much attention, who were ever fond of descriptive nicknames, 
called the king Magnus Barefoot. King Lagman of Man and the Hebrides disappears in 1101. Whether he died in that year, or departed on a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, as stated in the Chronica Regum Maniae, cannot be definitely determined. The chronicle also states that Magnus sent another king, Ingemund, to Man. But he was slain, and Magnus went to the islands to restore order and submission. This gives a credible explanation of Magnus's second expedition, which he seems to have undertaken for the purpose of organizing the western possessions for his son Sigurd, who was made king of the islands in 1102. His plan seems to have been to make Sigurd ruler of this new island kingdom, while his older son Øystein was to inherit the throne of Norway. The Welsh Chronicle states that Magnus visited Anglesey, cut a great deal of timber, and brought it to Man, where he built three castles, which he garrisoned with his own men. From Man he sailed to Dublin in 1102. The Heimskringla states that he captured Dublin in Dublinshire, and spent the winter with King Miriartark, in Cunachter, possibly Connacht, but this is wholly erroneous. The Ulster Annals have the following entry for the year 1102. In this year King Magnus came to Man, and he made peace with the Irish for one year. The four masters give a more detailed account. An Irish army was assembled at Dublin to resist Magnus and the Norsemen, who came to ravage the country, but they made peace for one year, and Myrkertak gave King Magnus's son Sigurd his daughter in marriage, and many costly presents with her. This shows that Magnus's second expedition could not have been undertaken with a view to conquer Ireland, but that it has been his aim to attach the island possessions more closely to the Norwegian crown. In these efforts he had been very successful. He re-established order in the islands, built and garrisoned forts for the maintenance of peace, brought in new colonists to settle and develop the districts which had been laid waste during the period of anarchy and misrule, and united the islands under a king, who was to govern them, subject to the authority of the king of Norway. These wisely conceived and ably directed efforts to establish an efficient government in these distant lands, which had hitherto been the spoils of reckless adventurers and the haunts of freebooters, might have had abiding results. A new era of peace and development might have dawned for them, had not death suddenly cut short King Magnus's career. It appears that in the summer of 1103 he left the Isle of Man, bound on a homeward voyage. He landed on the northeast coast of Ireland, where he made a raid into the country with but a small force. After he had penetrated quite a distance inland, he was suddenly attacked by an Irish army. Trusting in his bravery, he refused to retreat, but his men were overpowered by superior numbers in the marshes where the battle was fought, and Magnus himself fell. He was at this time thirty years of age, the accounts of this raid into Ireland, as given by the different sources, are much at variance. The sagas describe it as a foraging expedition, and state that Magnus was waiting for cattle to be brought him off and off Carnactum, when the Irish suddenly fell upon him. Ordericus Vitalis relates that Magnus landed on the coast of Ireland. The Irish were much afraid and did not dare to meet him in battle, but speaking fair words they prevailed on him to debark and when he had marched two miles into the country he was ambushed and slain. The Chronica Regum Maniae states that Magnus hastened ahead of his fleet with sixteen ships, that he imprudently landed in Ireland, where he was surrounded by the Irish, who slew the king and nearly all his men. He was buried at the St. Patrick's Church at Down, Down Patrick, the Chronicle adds. The essence of the whole matter seems to be contained in the statement of the Ulster Annals, that Magnus was attacked and killed by the Ulstonians on a plundering expedition. When Sigurd heard of his father's death, he became disheartened and returned to Norway. King Werchertak had formed an alliance with King Henry I of England, as both seemed to have regarded Magnus as a dangerous neighbor, and Olaf Bitling, a son of the former King Gudrid Crowen, was placed on the throne of Man. Though Magnus's plans thus suddenly came to naught, his work had, nonetheless, produced permanent results. The Jarls of the Orkneys and the Kings of Man and the Hebrides became more closely attached to Norway than hitherto, and the system and organization introduced by King Magnus continued to exist in the islands for well-nigh 150 years. 
the closer relations established with the lands in the west gave a great stimulus also to commercial intercourse between Norway and the British Isles, and new costumes and articles of luxury were introduced from Scotland and England. Magnus himself had formed a sort of partnership with an English merchant in Lincoln, who kept his treasury and supplied him with arms, ornaments, and other necessary affairs. After King Magnus's death, Henry I of England forced the merchant to turn over to him 20,000 pounds of silver. End of chapter 51。Section 52 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Norwegian Coat of Arms The Norwegian Coat of Arms, which consists of a golden lion with crown and battle axe and a red shield, was thought to have originated on Magnus Barefoot's expeditions to the British Isles. Snorra says that when Magnus fought and fell in Ireland, he wore a helmet and carried a red shield on which appeared a lion wrought in gold. He was girded with the sword Legbit, the best of weapons. Its hilt was of walrus teeth decorated with gold. He carried a spear, and over his shirt of mail he wore a cloak of red silk on which a lion was embroidered both on the front and in the back. Professor Gustav Storm observes that the oldest account of Magnus's last battle in Ireland, found in the Augrip auf Noregs König Sogum, not in the Heimskringla, mentions neither the red cloak nor the lions, but states that he had helmet, sword, and spear, and that he wore kilt, sitki hyp, and stockings, stieghoser, the Scotch dress in which he was usually attired. The later saga writers are evidently guilty of the anachronism of describing Magnus as wearing the royal attire, adorned with the coat of arms used in Snorra's own time by King Hawken Hawkinson and Skule Jarl, a very common failing of the saga writers. The question then confronts us, when and how did the Norwegian coat of arms originate? We have seen that the Norsemen usually decorated their ships and weapons with figures representing beasts and birds of prey like the dragon heads on their warships, and the raven, Odin's bird, on their sails and banners. These figures were symbols of bravery, and were employed to strike terror into the hearts of the enemy, but they had no heraldic character. In the twelfth century, the knight errants began to decorate their shields and banners with heraldic figures and devices, and in the course of the thirteenth century, these devices became family coats of arms. Professor Storm shows that the golden lion on a red shield, as a royal coat of arms, is traceable to the time of Hawken Hawkinson and Skule Jarl, i.e. not earlier than 1217. Both King Hawkins and Skule Jarl's seals, though damaged, have been preserved. Their device is a golden lion, without crown or battle axe, on a red three-cornered shield. King Hawkins' son, Crown Prince Hawken Hawkinson the Younger, chose the eagle as his coat of arms, but his younger brother, Magnus, who on Hawkins' death became heir apparent to the throne, had selected the lion, which thereby became the coat of arms of the royal family. Magnus's son and successor, Eric Magnusson, Priestother, retained this device, but the lion appears in his seal with the crown and the battle-axe of St. Olaf. End of section 52. Chapter 53 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1, by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Norway participates in the Crusades. Oysten Magnusson and Sigurd the Crusader. King Magnus Barefoot had many sons, but none of them was born in lawful wedlock. Oystein, the oldest, who was fourteen years of age, Sigurd, the next oldest, and Olaf succeeded their father as joint kings. The herd and lendermand were divided among the kings, perhaps also the royal estates. But Olaf was a mere child under the guardianship of his brothers, and as he died before he became of age, he may be left out of account. Harold Gila, who was still a child staying with his Irish mother in Ireland, is also generally acknowledged to have been a son of King Magnus, though his own assertion is about the only evidence of his royal descent. His mother called him Gilchrist, i.e. the servant of Christ. A later pretender, Sigurd Slembediakin, 
also claimed to be a son of Magnus, but he was generally regarded as an impostor and was finally captured and put to death. The principle prevailed that all the king's sons, illegitimate as well as legitimate, had an equal right to the throne. Kingship was regarded as an inherited right. The kingdom was looked upon as an inheritance which could be held in joint ownership or divided among the heirs. The practice of joint kingship, established in the time of Magnus the Good and Harald Hardrada, was adhered to. The kings kept their own herd and shared equally in the royal revenues, but the kingdom was not divided. The reign of the joint kings was regarded as lasting while any of them remained on the throne. With the death of Magnus Barefoot and the accession of his young sons, a period of peace was again inaugurated which lasted till the outbreak of the civil wars in 1130. During this period, the Archbishopric of Lund in Skåne was established, as already stated. Norway and Sweden, as well as Denmark, were included in this new church province, and the Scandinavian north was thereby separated from Germany with regard to ecclesiastical affairs. The intense religious enthusiasm which had been awakened through the efforts of the Pope, and especially by the Crusaders, and the zeal of the monastic orders had also reached the north, and the two kings, who were deeply influenced by the general spirit of the age, gave their most zealous efforts to the causes and ideals which had been created by the new awakening. The more warlike Sigurd became a crusader, while the peace-loving Oystein, who ruled the kingdom during his brother's absence, revived the policy of his grandfather Olaf Kyrre. He built churches and monasteries, improved the laws, maintained peace and order in the kingdom, and devoted special attention to useful internal improvements. In 1095, Pope Urban II preached at Clermont in France the first holy war against the infidels. The religious fervor was soon fanned into white heat by zealots like Peter the Hermit and Walter the Penniless, and large numbers of pilgrims gathered on the Rhine in northern France to march against the Turks. The sovereigns of Western Europe took no part in the First Crusade. Two of them, the Emperor Henry IV and King Philip I of France, were under the ban of the Church. The King of Spain was fighting against the Saracens at home, and the vicious William Rufus of England was hostile. The crusading hosts were, therefore, led by the great feudal magnates of Lotharingia, Burgundy, Normandy, Flanders, and the Norman colonies in southern Italy, men like Raymond of Toulouse, Hugh of Vermandois, a brother of King Philip I of France, Robert, Duke of Normandy, his cousin Robert II of Flanders, Stephen of Blois, the son-in-law of William the Conqueror, Godfrey of Bouillon, and the Italian Norman, Bohemond of Turenne a son of Robert Guiscard. The armies marched overland to Constantinople, where Emperor Alexius Comnenus had them transported across the Bosphorus into Asia Minor, after the leaders had taken an oath of fealty to him. Nicaea was captured in 1097, Antioch fell into their hands in 1098, and on June 15, 1099, Jerusalem was stormed by the sick and starving crusaders. Jerusalem was organized into a kingdom, and Godfrey of Bouillon became ruler, with the title of Baron and Advocate of the Holy Sepulcher. Bohemond the Norman became the Prince of Antioch, and Baldwin, brother of Godfrey, became Count of Edessa. Warriors from the Scandinavian kingdoms also participated in the First Crusade, but as they joined the main army in smaller bands, little is known of their fate or achievements. In 1097, a Danish noble, Sven by name, a member of the royal family, led a band of crusaders to Palestine. They took part in the capture of Edessa and marched to join in the siege of Antioch, but on the way they were betrayed into the power of the Mohammedans, who cut them down to the last man. In 1102, the Norwegian lendermand, Skofta Agmundsson, who had quarreled with King Magnus Barefoot, organized a crusading expedition to the Holy Land. Accompanied by his sons Finn, Agmund, and Thor, he sailed southward with five ships to Flanders, where he wintered. The next summer, 1103, they sailed for Italy, but Skofta died in Rome. His sons also found their graves on Italian soil. Thor died in Sicily, says the saga, but whether this happened before they reached Palestine or on the homeward journey is not stated, though the saga narrative seems to show that the expedition reached the Holy Land. When the sons of Magnus became kings, some men who had followed Skofta Agmundsson came from Jorsalaland, Jerusalem, and others from Miklgard, Constantinople. 
They were very renowned and brought many new tidings, and these accounts made many desirous of going thither. The news of the Crusades, which by this time had reached Norway through many channels, reawakened the old spirit of martial adventure among the Norsemen at home no less than among their kinsmen in Normandy and southern Italy. The transition from Viking expeditions to Crusades, already noticeable in Olaf Tryggvason's career as crusading Christian king, was neither great nor sudden, and it was now finally accomplished through the general change of conditions as well as through the growth of Christian spirit. We cannot doubt that many were eagerly awaiting an opportunity to go to Palestine to fight against the Mohammedans, but we hear nothing of any great religious enthusiasm, as it appears that most of them were actuated less by Christian zeal than by love of war and adventure and the prospects of gain and renown. They asked of the kings that one of them should be the leader of those who wished to join in this enterprise, says the saga. The kings agreed to this, and both of them together fitted out an expedition in which many leading men took part, both Lendermand and Storbunder. When everything was ready, it was decided that Sigurd should lead the expedition, but Oystein should rule the kingdom in the name of both. This undertaking was regularly planned and prepared crusade against the Turks in Palestine. The preparations lasted four years. A fleet of sixty ships was fully equipped and manned with ten thousand volunteer warriors from all parts of Norway. King Sigurd set sail from Hordaland, possibly from Bergen, in the fall of 1107, and went to England, where he was well received by King Henry I, who offered him his friendship and assistance, since he was engaged in so praiseworthy an undertaking. Sigurd spent the winter at the gay English court, and gave many rich presents to various English churches. In the spring, 1108, he continued his voyage, but he was much retarded by stormy weather, and did not reach Spain till late in the summer. He therefore decided to spend the winter there, and the governor of Galicia not only gave him permission to establish his winter quarters in that province, but promised also, on certain conditions, to supply him with the necessary provisions throughout the winter. But the governor took this promise rather lightly, and by Christmas time King Sigurd and his men were in want. With sword in hand, they decided to pay the governor a visit in his own castle, but he very discreetly abandoned it in haste, and they provisioned the fleet with the abundant stores which they found. Early in the spring, 1109, as they sailed southward along the west coast of Spain, now Portugal, they met a fleet of Moorish freebooters. The two fleets joined in battle, and after a hard fight, in which a great number of Moors fell, King Sigurd captured eight galleys, while the rest succeeded in making their escape. He thereupon landed at Kintra in Portugal, which had been taken by the Moors and aided Count Henry in capturing the city. He offered the Moors garrison their lives if they would accept the Christian faith, but when they refused he had them all put to death in the true fashion of crusaders. From Kintra he marched to Lisbon, which was also in the hands of the Moors. The sagas state that he battered down the walls and took the city, but this seems to be erroneous, since the place is known to have remained in the possession of the Moors after King Sigurd left. The contemporary skald, Halder Skvalder, who seems to have accompanied Sigurd, simply states that King Sigurd won his third victory by the Borg, which is called Lisbon. It seems likely that he won a victory over the Moors outside of the city, but he did not capture the city itself. The sagas state, quite correctly, that Lisbon was the boundary between heathen and Christian Spain. The Moors had seized that part of Portugal which lies south of the river Tejo, while the rest was still in the hands of the Christians. In the so-called heathen Spain, Sigurd captured a castle which is called Alcasa in the sagas, but as this name is only a corruption of Alcazar, a Spanish loanword from Arabic, meaning castle, as shown by Professor P. A. Munch, it is impossible to determine where this fortress was situated. After leaving Spain, he fought another successful engagement with the Moorish freebooters, who at this time controlled the Mediterranean Sea. He then continued his voyage eastward until he reached the island of Formentera, in the Balearic Isles. Here the freebooters had established a stronghold in a cave in the side of a mountain. The steep ascent leading to the entrance of the cave was protected by a breastwork of stone, and the cave itself was divided into two parts, or chambers, of which the innermost seems to have served as a storehouse for the booty which they gathered from all the Mediterranean coasts. Sigurd tried to capture the cave, but his men were unable to ascend the steep incline against the showers of stones and missiles hold upon them by the freebooters, who felt so secure in their inaccessible retreat that they jeered and ridiculed the Norsemen, and showed them costly articles to betoken their contempt. 
King Sigurd then took two boats, filled them with warriors, and lowered them by ropes from the top of the mountain before the entrance of the cave. The men in the boats shot with arrows and compelled the Moors to abandon the breastwork and retreat into the cave. The assailants were now able to break through the stone wall in front of the entrance and gain accession to the cave. The Moors fled to their inner chamber, but the Norsemen kindled a fire and smoked them out. They were all killed, and all their booty fell into the hands of the Norsemen. After visiting the islands of Iviza, Minorca, and possibly also Majorca, where they also fought with the Moors, they sailed to Sicily and Apulia, where they met their kinsmen, the Normans, who had gained control of those parts of southern Italy. The Normans in Italy still felt themselves akin to the Norsemen, and Duke Roger of Sicily was married to Edla, the widow of King Canute, the saint of Denmark. King Sigurd and his army of crusaders were therefore received with the greatest joy and hospitality. There was a splendid reception, and every day Duke Roger himself waited on King Sigurd at the table, says the saga. But on the seventh day of the feast, after the men had taken a bath, King Sigurd took the duke by the hand and led him to the high seat and gave him the title of King of Sicily. Sigurd spent the winter in Sicily and arrived at Ascalon in Palestine in August 1110. Fulker of Chartres gives the following account of his achievements in Palestine. In the meantime, there had landed at Joppa, Jaffa, a people called the Norsemen, whom God had stirred up to journey from the western ocean to Jerusalem. Their fleet consisted of sixty ships. Their leader was a young man of exceedingly fine appearance, a brother of the king of that country. As the king, Baldwin, had returned to Jerusalem, he rejoiced exceedingly over their arrival, spoke kindly to them, admonished them, and asked them out of love of God to stay a while in the land to which they had come, and help him to spread Christianity. They could then, after having served the cause of Christ in some way, give thanks to God when they returned to their own country. They assented gladly, and answered that they had come to the Holy Land with no other intention. They promised to follow him with their fleet wherever he would go with his army, if he would provide them with the necessary provisions. This was agreed to and fulfilled. They first decided to go to Ascalon, but later they decided the better plan of attacking and besieging the city of Sidon. The king led his army from Ptolemaida, which is now generally called Akon, while the Norsemen, well-armed, sailed from the harbor of Jaffa. The fleet of the Emir of Babylonia lay at that time hidden in the harbor of Tyre. The Saracens annoyed the Christians, or pilgrims, on their buccaneering expeditions, and they provisioned by various routes the seacoast towns which were still in the hands of the king of Babylonia but when they heard about the Norsemen, they did not venture to leave the harbor of Tyre, for they did not dare to fight with them. When the king came to Sidon, he laid siege to the city, while the Norsemen attacked it from the sea. With war machines, they so terrified the inhabitants that the garrison asked the king to be permitted to depart unharmed. He could then, if he wished, keep the people of the city and use them for tilling the soil. This was asked and granted. The garrison retired, but the land's folk remained in peace according to the agreement. The sun had visited the archer, the constellation, nineteen times when the Sidonians, in the month of December, 19th of December, 1110, surrendered their city. This account, which is in full accord with the sagas, is substantiated also by a number of other sources. Sigurd claimed no reward for aiding in the capture of Sidon, but Baldwin distributed rich presents among his men, and gave him a chip of the Holy Cross which Sigurd promised under oath to preserve at the shrine of St. Olaf. He also made a vow to introduce the system of tithes in Norway, and to do everything in his power to secure the establishment of an archbishopric in Nidaros. King Sigurd left Palestine shortly after the capture of Sidon, and went to Constantinople, where he was magnificently entertained by Emperor Alexios Komnenos, called Kyriolex in the sagas. Sigurd and his men were escorted through the Golden Portal, Porta Aurea, through which the emperors alone entered the city when they returned in triumph from successful military campaigns. They were quartered in the Blockernea Palace, and were entertained with games in the Hippodrome at the emperor's expense. When Sigurd left, he gave Alexios all his ships, and many of his men remained in Constantinople, and entered the service of the emperor. Sigurd and his crusaders returned through Bulgaria, Hungary, Austria, and Germany. About midsummer they arrived in Schleswig, where the Danish Jarl Eilif entertained them. King Nicholas, Nils, of Denmark, who was married to Sigurd's stepmother, Margareta Fredkula, 
received him with the greatest hospitality, accompanied him through Jutland, and gave him a fully equipped ship on which he returned to Norway in July 1111. He was received with great rejoicing, and his brother Oystein, who had ruled the kingdom during his three and a half years' absence, cheerfully surrendered to him the share of the kingdom which he had held in trust. It was a common opinion, says the saga, that no one had made a more memorable expedition from Norway. He was called Sigurd Jorsalafarer, Jorsal equals Jerusalem, a name by which he is generally known in history. End of chapter 53「Chapter 54 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershit. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. King Oystein Magnusson's Reign, The Acquisition of Jämtland During Sigurd's absence, Oystein ruled the kingdom with great ability. He showed rare talent for administration, and furthered a peaceful development with such devoted interest that his reign is remembered as one of the most benign and prosperous in the history of the country. He is described as a man of medium size with blue eyes and light curly hair. He had acquired extensive legal knowledge, and he distinguished himself through equanimity and great wisdom in council. The people loved him highly for his friendly and cheerful disposition and his love of peace and justice. His brother Sigurd Jorsalafar, crusader, was not like him. He had auburn hair, and was tall and well-built, but not good-looking. He was a great athlete and a very ambitious prince, but usually gloomy and reticent. At times he showed a violent temper, and he often punished offenders severely, but he was generous to a fault, frank, brave, and upright. The more untoward traits of his character can only be explained as an inception of insanity, which in his later years enveloped him in mental darkness. With the instinct of a statesman, King Oystein soon took steps to join the province of Jämtland to the Norwegian kingdom. This independent border district had been settled in early days by colonists from Trundelagen, and when Harald Harfagra had won all Norway, many people who were dissatisfied with the new order of things emigrated into Jämtland and the neighboring districts, Helsingland and Herjedalon. We have seen that in the time of Haakon the Good, the people of Jämtland voluntarily placed themselves under the authority of the king of Norway, as they preferred his overlordship to that of the Swedish king. This step proves that they considered themselves as Norsemen. The province belonged to Norway till in the time of King Olaf the Saint, when it was seized by the king of Sweden, and it remained a Swedish dependency until it was reunited with Norway in Oystein's reign. In ecclesiastical affairs, however, it always formed a part of the diocese of Uppsala. Herjedalan, which is often mentioned together with Jämtland, belonged to the diocese of Trondhjem, and seems always to have been a Norwegian province. King Oystein sent messengers to Jämtland to the wisest and most powerful men, says the saga, and invited them to visit him. He received with great cordiality those who came, and gave them valuable gifts. He also sent presents to some who did not come, and in this way he gained the friendship of all those who ruled that country. He spoke to them and showed them that the people of Jämtland had acted unwisely in withdrawing their allegiance and their taxes from the kings of Norway. He mentioned that the people of that province had given their allegiance to Haakon Adelstein's foster, Haakon the Good, and had long remained subject to the Norwegian kings. He pointed out how many necessary articles they could get from Norway, and how much trouble it would cause them to get what they needed from the king of Sweden. He succeeded so well with his arguments that the people of their own accord made an offer and asked that they might be allowed to pledge their allegiance to King Oystein, which they termed their need and necessity. The union was brought about in the following manner. The leading men asked the people to take an oath of fealty, and afterwards they went to King Oystein and gave him the country. How the province of Jämtland could be enticed away from Sweden and joined to Norway without causing an open rupture between the two countries, it is not easy to explain, even if, according to Oystein's view of the matter, Norway still had a valid claim to this border district which Sweden had unrightfully seized. The inactivity of the Swedish king must have been due to circumstances which made it impossible for him to pay attention to this distant province, but what these circumstances were is left to conjecture. If King Inge Stenkelson was still alive, which is not known, he was now an aged man, possibly too weak to take a very active part in the affairs of state. 
if he was dead, it is not improbable that jealousy between rival candidates for the throne had temporarily crippled the government, and that King Oyston used such a moment of weakness for his shrewd and well-planned move. Monasticism made its appearance in Norway at this time, and several monasteries of the Benedictine order were built during the 12th century. Sigurd Ulstring founded a monastery of this order, probably in 1104, and King Oyston began the erection of a St. Michael's church and monastery at Nordness, near Bergen. The buildings were large stone structures, but it is not known whether they were finished in Oyston's time. It has been thought that the St. Albanus Monastery at Selja, and the three nunneries, Gimse at Skien, Nonesether in Oslo, and Baca in Trondheim, were also founded in Oyston's reign, but this is doubtful. The St. Albanus Monastery is not heard of till in King Sverre Sigurdsson's reign, and the nunneries are not mentioned till in the second half of the 12th century. The rules of the order required the Benedictine monks to divide the time not spent in devotional exercises between physical labor, especially gardening and horticulture, and study, which consisted chiefly in the copying of books and manuscripts. They introduced many new varieties of plants and trees, and the fruit raising, which now flourishes in many districts of Norway, was developed mainly by their skillful and painstaking efforts. To their literary activity we are indebted, especially for some valuable works in the early history of Norway the most noteworthy of which is the Historia de Antiquitate Regum Norwegiensum by Theodricus Monachus. Owing to the interest of the kings in religious matters, Norway was fast swinging into line with regard to church organization and ecclesiastical affairs generally. The diocese of Bergen was divided, and a new bishopric was established at Stavanger. No city had yet been founded there, but wharves had been built on the fine harbor, which was visited by merchant ships in great numbers. When the bishop's residence was located there, a new development began, and Stavanger is spoken of as a city already in the latter half of the 12th century. Reinald, Regnald, a Benedictine monk from Winchester, England, was made bishop, and his first thought seems to have been to erect a cathedral church, which of necessity had to adorn every bishop's seat in those times. It was a great undertaking, as the cathedrals were built by the church, not by the state but the Catholic bishops were men of wealth and power. They had the rank of jarls and enjoyed a princely income. Large tracts of land had been granted to the diocese, and when King Sigurd the Crusader introduced the system of tithes, the bishops also received one-fourth of this new revenue. They had also a considerable income from royal fiefs and from fines paid by those who transgressed against the ordinances of the church. For undertakings of special importance, the bishop could also call upon the people for a general contribution. A cathedral was erected, which is still the pride of the beautiful city of Stavanger. It was built in the Romanesque style after the pattern of the Winchester Cathedral in England, and seems to have been completed about 1150. It was dedicated to St. Switham, Bishop of Winchester in England, 837-862, to 862, and a shrine containing some relics of the saint, which had been brought from England for the purpose, was deposited in the church. A new bishopric was also established at Holar in Iceland in 1106 and a cathedral was erected at Kirkeberg, in the Faroe Islands, where a diocese was now permanently established. The attempt of Bishop Eric Gnupsen of Greenland to Christianize the Skrælings in Vinland has already been mentioned elsewhere. He was evidently lost on the voyage, as he was never again heard of. King Oystein erected churches in Trondheim and at Trondenes in Nordland. In Bergen he built a royal residence, which was said to be the finest wooden structure in Norway. Close to this hall he built the Apostle Church, which was used as a royal chapel. Oystein's efforts were wholly directed towards the peaceful upbuilding of the kingdom through internal improvements and the encouragement of commerce. He constructed a new harbor at Ogdenes, at the entrance to the Trondhamsford, and improved the harbor of Sundholm Sound near Bergen. On the mountain tops along the coast he caused beacons to be erected for the guidance of mariners. These improvements were of importance to commerce, which was developing rapidly at this time, especially through the increased export of herring and codfish. The numerous pilgrimage to St. Olaf's shrine had increased travel across the Dover Mountains, but as the journey through the wilds from eastern Norway to Trondheim was difficult and dangerous, Oystein erected three mountain stations where travelers could find shelter and refreshments. Though primarily intended for pilgrims, these stations proved to be such an aid to all travelers that the traffic across the mountains was greatly increased. 
the relation between the kings though peaceful was not cordial and at times it was marred by more serious clashes provoked by sigurd's jealous disposition and violent temper snorra has pictured an altercation between them in the heimskringla in the happiest vein of his inimitable style the episode as he describes it must be regarded as drama rather than history but it gives a most vivid picture of the temper and character of the two kings one winter the kings oystein and sigurd were entertained in Oplandene, and each had his own residence but as the estates where they were to dwell were not far apart their followers agreed that the kings should stay together and that they should visit one another in turn at first they were all assembled at the home of king oystein but in the evening when the drinking feast began the ale was not to their liking and the men were reticent oystein said the men are silent but it is more in coming with custom to be merry over the drinking cup let us have some merriment and there will still be good cheer among the men it is proper brother sigurd that we should begin some jocular conversation but sigurd replied curtly be as talkative as you please but allow me to be quiet king oystein said it has often been customary at the drinking feast that one compares himself with another so let it be now but sigurd remained silent i see said oystein that i have to begin this diversion i will compare myself with you brother i must mention that we are equal in honor and possessions and there is no difference in our descent or education king sigurd answered do you remember that i could throw you in a wrestling match whenever i pleased though you were a year older oystein said but i also remember that you did not win in the contests which require agility sigurd said do you remember that when we were swimming i could duck you under whenever i pleased oystein answered i swam as far as you did and i could swim equally well under water i could also skate so well that i know of no one who could compete with me in that sport but you could not skate better than an ox sigurd said it seems to me that it is a sport better fitted for chieftains to be able to shoot well with bow and arrow but you cannot use my bow if you draw it with your feet oystein answered i am not so strong with the bow but there is little difference in our ability to hit the mark in skiing i am your superior and that has hitherto been accounted a fine sport sigurd said it seems to me especially befitting a chieftain that he who is to be the leader of others should be tall and strong and better able to wield the weapon than other men so that he can be easily recognized where many are assembled king oystein said it is no less important that a man is handsome he is then easily recognized in a multitude that too appears to me to be a quality of a chieftain for fine clothes suit well a handsome man i am also better versed in the laws than you are and when we speak i am more eloquent sigurd said it may be that you know more tricks in law than i do for i have had other things to contend with no one denies that you have a smoother tongue but many say that you do not always keep your word but that you take your promises lightly that you seemingly agree with everyone you talk with and that is no kingly conduct king oystein said when people bring their suits before me my first thought is to bring the cause of each party to a conclusion that will seem best to him but then comes also the counterpart and the quarrel is then often adjusted in a way satisfactory to both it often happens that i promise to do what people ask of me for i desire that all should go away well pleased but i have the choice also if i wish to do like you and threaten everybody with punishment and i have heard no one complain that you do not keep your promise king sigurd said it has been generally recognized that the expedition which i made when i left our land was an achievement worthy of a chieftain but you stayed at home like your father's daughter king oystein answered now you touch the ulcer i should not have started this conversation if i could make no reply on this point it should almost seem as if i sent you from home like my sister when you were equipped for the expedition king sigurd said i suppose you have heard that i fought many battles in turkey which you have heard mentioned i was victorious in all of them and secured a great deal of valuable booty such as never has been brought to this land i was most honored where i met the best men but i am afraid that you are still the home-bred greenhorn king oystein said i have heard that you fought some battles abroad but it was of more value to our country that i erected five churches from the very foundations i also constructed a harbor at agdenes where there was no harbor before and where every sailor had to pass in going north or south along the coast i also built the stone tower in sundholm sound and the royal hall in bergen while you sent saracens to the devil in turkey which i think was of little benefit to our kingdom king sigurd said 
On my expedition I went even as far as the river Jordan, and I swam across the river, but on the river bank are some small trees, and among these I tied a knot, and spoke over it that you, my brother, should untie it, or you should be spoken of accordingly. King Oystein said, I will not untie the knot which you have tied for me, but I might have tied you a knot which you would have been far less able to untie, the time when you sailed with one ship into my fleet on your return. After this they remained silent, and both were angry. A more serious collision between the two kings occurred in connection with the suit brought by King Sigurd against his lendermand, Sigurd Ranison, whom he accused of defalcation and fraud. Ranison had been a faithful friend and companion of King Magnus Barefoot, and he was married to Skeldvar, King Magnus's sister. He had been appointed royal tax collector in Finmarken, and had a monopoly on the trade with the Finns. King Sigurd accused him of having withheld sixty marks of silver yearly, which rightfully belonged to the royal treasury, and Ranison feared that, although he was innocent, the decision might go against him when the suit was brought before the thing. He therefore hastened to Viken placed his case before King Oystein, and asked his assistance. Oystein investigated the matter carefully, and advised Ranison as to what course to pursue. In the spring, King Oystein went to Trondhjem for the purpose of bringing about a reconciliation between Ranison and King Sigurd. But Sigurd summoned a by-thing, where he accused Ranison of having collected taxes, and of having seized the trade with the Finns without authority. Oystein pointed out that the case was of such a character that it could not be tried at a by-thing, but would come under the jurisdiction of a regular thing, and Sigurd had to postpone the matter. He summoned a thing to meet within two weeks, and left the meeting with his men. At the appointed time both kings appeared at the thing with a large number of armed followers, and Sigurd reiterated his accusations against Ranison, who maintained that he was innocent and that the king had been misinformed. Oystein spoke very eloquently in Ranison's behalf, and showed that if the case was to be settled according to law and justice, it would have to be brought before the Thrandarnes thing, as the thing which King Sigurd had mentioned had no jurisdiction over a vassal. After the logmaind, those learned in the law, had carefully weighed the matter, they declared the point raised by King Oystein to be well taken. The thing had to be adjourned, and King Sigurd summoned Ranison to plead his cause at the Thrandarnes thing within a fortnight. Both kings gathered strong forces and met on the day appointed. When King Oystein approached the thing, he said to Ranison, What offer doest thou intend to make, and how wilt thou defend thyself today at the thing? Ranison answered, From you I expect to get counsel and help. Oystein said, Come now hither if thou wilt follow my advice, and give me thy hand as a token that thou wilt transfer thy cause to me. It is proper that we brothers should look each other in the eye and see who is best versed in the law. This was done, and Oystein went to the thing with his men. King Sigurd repeated his charges against Ranison, and Oystein again spoke in his defense. But when Sigurd declared that he was determined to have the case settled according to the law, King Oystein said, I have indeed said, brother, that you should bring this case against Ranison before the Thrandarnes thing, but since a slight change has now taken place, so that the kings themselves are parties in the case, it cannot be decided at a focus thing, but must be brought before the log thing. The frosta thing alone has now jurisdiction in this case, and there it must be decided, if it must absolutely be decided according to law. I have taken upon myself this case against Sigurd Ranison, so that we kings are now parties in it. This you cannot gainsay. King Sigurd declared that he would not yield, and he summoned Oystein to appear before the frosta thing. But this thing had already been adjourned, and would not assemble again till the following summer. When the log thing convened, King Sigurd preferred his charges against Ranison in the most carefully prepared legal form, and Oystein undertook to conduct the defense. The lenderman Jan Mornev, a man very learned in the law, was leader and spokesman for the Lagretha. It is clear that Logmaind were also present at the thing, Ronison was able to prove that King Magnus Barefoot had granted him the trade with the Finns as a monopoly, and that he had made the provision that this grant should also continue throughout the reign of his sons. It was for the thing, then, to decide whether Magnus could make a grant for a period extending beyond his own reign. The Logmain found that the king could make permanent grants, but in order to be valid such grants had to be published at all the log things, Frosta thing, Gula thing, etc., but Ronison had no witnesses to prove that he had complied with the law on this point. 
King Sigurd declared that he would not recognize this to be the law, that a king could make a grant for a longer period than his own reign, and maintained that it had now been proven that Ranesson had no right to the trade with the Finns. Oyston maintained that the king had the right to make such grants, but as it seemed impossible to wholly remove all doubt on this point, the chieftains proposed that the kings should cast lots as to whose view should prevail. To this they consented. Sigurd was successful, and he declared his view to be adopted. The point was now raised whether Ronison had gained possession of the wares which he had collected, without the consent of the owners. The landerman Bergthor Bach testified against him on this point, and King Sigurd demanded that the defendant should be declared guilty and punished. But Oyston had not yet exhausted all his resources in this legal duel. He said that it seemed to him to be very unjust to find Ranison guilty when King Magnuson made the grant in behalf of his sons, and it had hitherto not been revoked. He requested the thing to pause a few moments before rendering a decision, and this was granted. He then called witnesses to prove that the case had already been dismissed at three previous things, and showed that when a case, because of irregular procedure, had been dismissed thrice, it could not again be brought before a thing. This law point was accepted by the Legretta as applying to the case, and no decision could be given by the thing. We can scarcely blame King Sigurd for waxing wroth when he again found himself worsted in this way. He left the thing, and vowed that since Oystein had blocked justice by shrewd tricks, he would now seek it in some other way. The relations between the brothers were now strained to the breaking point, and civil war seemed imminent. In the evening after the thing adjourned, Oystein returned to his residence, and talked with his men about the trial just concluded. He asked Ranison what he thought of the outcome, and Ranison answered that he was very thankful to the king for what he had done for him. The Morkenskina continues, Shortly afterwards, Sigurd Ranison found an opportunity to leave the house. It was late in the evening, and when he had assured himself that no one noticed him, he walked hastily away alone. He had no mantle, he wore a scarlet coat and blue trousers buttoned outside the coat and buckled about the waist. In his hand he carried a javelin with a handle so short that his hand touched the iron. He walked down the street and did not stop until he came to the wharf which touched the stern of King Sigurd's ship. A man sat there, keeping guard. Ranison asked permission to enter the ship, but the guard refused. Choose then, said Ranison. Leave the wharf now, or this spear will pierce you. The guard withdrew, and he entered the ship and walked forward towards the front. There the men were seated by the tables, and no one noticed him until he knelt before the king and said, I do not wish, King Sigurd, that you brothers, as it now appears, should begin war against one another for my sake. I will rather give myself and my head into your power. Do with me as you please, for I will rather die than cause hostilities between you and your brother. Many of the men interceded for him, and begged Sigurd to show him mercy since he had surrendered himself to the king. King Sigurd said, you are truly a noble man, Sigurd Ranison, and you have taken a course which is best for us all. It looked as if misfortune was about to happen, so great that God alone could know the outcome. I had decided to go up to Yulfold in the morning with my men and fight with King Oystein. I am now willing to bring about a reconciliation if you will leave the matter to my decision. This Ranison did. King Sigurd said, I will not delay settlement, for this case has been long drawn out. You must pay a fine of fifteen marks, which sum is to be paid in full tomorrow before the services are at an end in the Christ Church. My brothers intended to disgrace me, but I will guard their honor as carefully as my own. You must pay five marks to King Oystein and five marks to King Olav, and you must pay them before you pay me. This fine you are to pay in pure gold, for I have been told that you have grown rich in gold from taxes which you have collected. But if you do not pay this money exactly in the manner which I have stated, the reconciliation between us is at an end. Sigurd Ranison answered, I thank you, my lord, for your willingness to become reconciled, howsoever it may be with my wealth. Sigurd Ranison had no gold, but he succeeded in borrowing five marks from his friends. This sum he first offered King Oystein, but he refused to accept it, and told Ranison that he would make him a present of it. When he brought the gold to King Olaf, he said that he would do as his brother Oystein had done. Finally, he offered Sigurd the five marks. The king said that he would give him the gold if he would be his friend in case hostilities should ever break out between him and Oystein. 
Ronison answered, I hope that you will never again disagree, for I wish both you and your brothers well, but however much gold will be at stake, yes, even if it should cost me my life, I will esteem no one higher than King Oystein as long as I live. The king then gave him the gold without condition. Ronison thanked him, and invited the king to dine with him that same day with as many followers as he wished to bring, and King Sigurd accepted the invitation. After mass, he went to Ranison's house with forty men. When they entered the hall, they found it beautifully decorated with tapestries and weapons. The walls were hung with shields, and everything was so elegantly arranged that the king and his men were quite surprised. The feast was very magnificent and lasted the whole day. Ranison and his men waited on the guests, carried in beverages and everything which they wanted. When they were gone, so that the king was alone with his followers, he said to them, where have you ever seen a house of a vassal furnished like this? You will not find the like even in the halls of kings. It surpasses anything that is to be seen anywhere. Bergthor Bach answered, Fine weapons these are indeed, and everything is beautifully arranged. But it would have been a greater honor for our host if he had owned some of these fine things himself and had not borrowed them all. King Sigurd became offended and replied, we can see how many friends the man has when we notice that he can get from others everything which he wishes. But thou hast not spoken kindly. Ranison now stepped into the hall, and he had heard what had been said. When the bells tolled for the vespers, the king prepared to leave. Ranison gave him costly presents and invited him to return after the vespers to drink a toast to the memory of Christ. This invitation the king accepted. When King Sigurd and his men returned to the hall, all the shields had been removed except an old shield and a mantle which hung by the table where the drinks were served. A sudden change has taken place while we were gone, said Sigurd. It is but to be expected, my lord, said Ranison, that each one wants his articles returned. I own no shield save this old one which hangs yonder, and whether or not I am to keep that you shall decide. The story of this shield is as follows. We accompanied your father, King Magnus, on his expedition to Ireland and we landed for the last time on the Irish coast, which we should not have done. An invincible Irish army came against us. A battle began, as you know, and the great misfortune happened that King Magnus, your father, Stalera Oivind Alboga, and many other brave heroes fell. Our army fled, and all hurried to the ships as fast as they could, but I was not among the first to flee. As they hurried to the ships, a deep swamp near the coast retarded their flight. They attempted to jump over it, and some succeeded, but others did not, and many of those who did not get across were stabbed with spears. When we approached the swamp, I saw a man in front of me. He had this shield on his back, and this mantle about him. When he noticed that it was difficult to cross the swamp, he first threw away the shield, then he tore off his mantle. He wore a silk cap, and the most honorable thing he did, it seemed to me, was that he did not also throw away the cap. It seemed to me that this man was Bergthor Bach, but Vidkun Jonsson knows, for he was present when I picked up the shield and the mantle. In the battle I had had no shield. Since then I have kept this shield, and now, my lord, you may decide whether I or Bergthor should own it. The king answered curtly, Keep thou the shield. The king left, and Bergthor was very angry. Shortly afterward King Olaf died, as has already been told. Sigurd and Oystein were both kings, but from this time on they were not real friends, though peace was maintained while they lived. King Oystein died in 1122, thirty-three years of age, at Hustad in Romsdal, and was interred in the Christ Church in Trondheim. At no man's buyer had there been so many mourners since the death of King Magnus the Good, the son of St. Olaf, says the Heimskringla. The report of the case against Sigurd Ronison is one of the most valuable documents in all saga literature dealing with Norse jurisprudence. It brings to view a highly developed legal system adapted to an intricate court procedure by astute lawyers, whose skillful pleadings remind us of the proceedings in modern common law courts. The laws had not been made by great lawgivers, but had been gradually evolved from the sense of justice of the whole people. The things, both local and superior, gave the people an opportunity to participate directly in the deliberations on all important public questions. All controversies were adjudicated there, and the decisions rendered expressed the best sentiment and most intelligent will of the community. This system developed in time an intimate knowledge of the law, 
the love for its details, the pride in its intricacies, but also the profound respect for its authority which was the virtue and strength of the Norse social organization. The thing system developed in the people an ability for self-government, a sense for legal justice, a regard for the rights of the individual which made arbitrary decisions and tyrannical government impossible. The people in council at the thing was the highest tribunal and authority in the land, before which even kings had to plead their cause. During the centuries in which the life and traits of the Norsemen were rapidly fashioned into a permanent national character, these institutions of popular self-government were developing in the Norwegian people the spirit of freedom which expresses itself in an intense love for individual autonomy and national independence in all subsequent Norwegian history. End of chapter 54Chapter 55 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Reign of King Sigurd the Crusader. After Eystein's death, Sigurd ruled Norway for seven years, pursuant to the policy of peace and cultural development inaugurated by his brother. He made a crusade against the Swedish province of Småland and forced the yet heathen inhabitants of this district to accept the Christian faith but the expedition seems to have been undertaken for the purpose of fulfilling a promise which he had made in Palestine, that he would do everything possible to further the cause of Christianity. Sigurd was imbued with a religious zeal of the crusading type characteristic of the age, and he sought earnestly to improve the organization of the church, and to give the clergy more power and greater independence of secular authorities. By these efforts he was clearly assisting the church in its efforts to establish itself as an independent power and supreme authority, though he was, possibly, unable to foresee that this new power, once securely established, would recoil most forcibly against the royal authority which had been instrumental in creating it. The statement of Ordericus Vitalis, that Sigurd first built monasteries in Norway and established permanent bishoprics there, is indeed erroneous, but he established a fourth bishopric at Stavanger though the year when this happened cannot be determined. He continued the work on the Christ Church in Bergen and completed the St. Halvard's Church in Oslo. He had also promised while in Jerusalem to make his kingdom an archbishopric, but this promise he could not fulfill as the Church of Norway was still too little developed to be organized into an independent ecclesiastical province. The most important step taken by Sigurd in church affairs was the introduction of the system of tithes, this was a tithe on incomes, and was to be substituted for the salaries which had hitherto been paid to the priests and functionaries of the church. But the salaries were collected as before, and the clergy could now rejoice over a great increase in their income. King Sigurd established his permanent residence in the trading town of Konghelle, in southeastern Norway, which through his efforts soon ranked with the most important cities in the kingdom. He erected a large castle there, and surrounded it with walls and moats. Inside the walls he built a royal residence and erected the Church of the Holy Cross, to which he gave the chip of the cross of Christ which he had received in Jerusalem. He had promised to deposit it in the Christ Church in Trondheim, but he donated it to this new church, as it seems, for the purpose of giving the growing town of Konghelle increased prestige. On the altar of the church he placed a costly chest which he had received from Prince Eric Emune of Denmark, and also a plenarium written with gold letters which the Patriarch of Jerusalem had given him. In speaking of the Norwegian cities at this time, Ordericus Vitalis says, Along the coast of Norway, by the sea, are found the following five cities, Bergen, Konghelle, Kaupang, Nidaros, Borg, Sarpsborg, and Oslo. There is also a sixth city by the name of Tunsberg, which lies eastwards towards the Danes. Stavanger is not mentioned. King Sigurd had suffered at times from serious mental aberrations which plunged him into the deepest anguish and despondency. As years passed, his mental condition grew worse, until he was seized with violent fits of insanity. On Pentecost Sunday, as he sat in his hall with his queen, Malmfried, surrounded by many friends and guests, his men noticed to their horror that the king had suddenly become insane. He rolled his eyes wildly and stared around the hall and at his men. He grabbed a costly book written with golden letters, which he had brought from Constantinople, looked at the queen, and said, How much can be changed in a person's lifetime? When I came to this land, I had two things which I considered more precious than all the others, 
this book and my queen. Now it seems to me that one is worse than the other. The queen does not know how horrid she looks. She has a goat horn in her forehead, and the more lovely she looked then, the more horrid she looks now. This book is worth nothing. With these words he threw the book into the fire and struck the queen in the face. She wept, but more because of the king's illness than because of his conduct towards her. Before the king stood a young Kurtisven, page, Otter Berting, small in stature but handsome and dark-haired. He snatched the book from the fire and said to the king, It is different now, my lord, from the day when you returned with honor and glory to Norway, and all your friends hastened to meet you and greeted you with reverence as their king. Now days of sorrow have come. Many of your friends have assembled to celebrate this festival, but they cannot be glad because of your sad condition. Be good, my lord, and take my advice. Console with your kindness the queen, whom you have grievously wronged, and also your chieftains, your herd, your friends, and your servants. What? shouted the king. Darest thou, ugly peasant boy of the humblest descent, to give me advice? He jumped up and raised the sword with both hands over the boy's head. But Berting looked at him calm and fearless, and the king dropped the side of the sword on his shoulder, and sat down without saying a word. Everybody in the hall was silent. The king had now regained his composure and looked around with calmness. But late one tries his own men and learns how they really are, he said. Here my best friends are assembled, Lendermain, Stollerer, Skultilsweiner, and the foremost men in the land, but no one served me as well as this page, whom I suppose you consider very inferior to yourselves. This page is Otter Berthing. He has shown me the greatest devotion. Here I, an insane man, was about to destroy my treasure but he saved it so that it was not damaged. Neither did he fear death, but he spoke to me in such words that I felt honored. He did not mention anything that could arouse my anger, although he had good reason to. He spoke so well that no one present could have spoken better. I jumped up in a rage and was going to strike him with the sword, but he was so brave that he showed no fear. Therefore I did him no harm, for he ought not to die because of his virtue. But now, my friends, I will let you know how I intend to reward him. Hitherto he has been my Curtis fan, now he shall be my Landerman. And before that he shall from this moment be the foremost among the Landerman. Take therefore, Otter, thy seat among the Landerman. Thou shalt serve no longer. Otter became afterwards a prominent and highly honored man. It may have been largely due to his diseased state of mind that Sigurd finally put away Queen Malmfried and married a young lady, Cecilia, with whom he had fallen in love. Bishop Magni of Bergen refused to allow this marriage to be performed, but Sigurd finally induced Bishop Reinald of Stavanger to grant permission, by offering to contribute liberally to the Stavanger Cathedral which the bishop was building. King Sigurd died in Oslo in the spring of the year 1130, and was interred in the church of St. Halvard. End of chapter 55「Chapter 56 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1 by Knut Gershet. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 56 The Period of Civil Wars Magnus the Blind, Harald Gila, and Sigurd Slembed Jakin. King Sigurd the Crusader had his faults, but he was an able ruler, and he was loved and respected by his subjects. His expeditions abroad had won him honor and distinction. At home he continued with ability and upright purpose the policy of peaceful development inaugurated by Oystein, which made the reign of the sons of Magnus Barefoot one of the most benign and prosperous in the early centuries of Norwegian history. The darkness of the long period of civil strife, bloodshed, and confusion which followed upon the death of Sigurd becomes still deeper when we view it against the background of the prosperous and peaceful era which preceded it. Instead of great national kings, the period of civil wars ushers past with kaleidoscopic rapidity arrogant and incompetent heirs to the throne, contemptible pretenders, daring fortune-seekers, and worthless puppet kings who hold the throne for a day to be swept from the political chessboard by plots and assassinations. Progress is retarded, and the energies of the nation wasted by the endless strife between rival candidates for the throne. The old writers look upon the period as if the wrath of heaven had suddenly fallen upon the country. 
Saxo Grammaticus compares the coming of Harald Gila to Norway with a destructive thunderstorm which suddenly swept over the country, and the Morkin Skino lets King Sigurd prophesy that evil days would come after his death. Unfortunate are you, Norsemen, that you have an insane king to rule over you, but the time will come when you would give red gold to have me for a king rather than Harald Gila or Magnus, the one cruel, the other foolish. But we need not explain the evils of this period, either as the wrath of an offended deity, or as a result of the wickedness or incompetence of a single man. The civil wars were only a revival of old evils in an aggravated form, and they were due, in the main, to the same causes which had produced civil wars in earlier days. The circumstance that there was no regulated succession to the throne, but that all the sons of the king or kings had an equal claim to the kingship, whether they were born in lawful wedlock or not, was itself sufficient cause for civil strife, as it became possible for any bold adventurer to put forward a claim to the throne, based on the assertion that he was of royal blood. During this period, the various aspirants to the throne were weak and worthless men, children or ill-starred adventurers. In such hands, royal power could become nothing but a name and a shadow. The aristocracy gained control, and willingly aided the worthless kings in weakening and destroying one another. The chieftains fought, indeed, under various standards with seeming zeal for the claims and rights of the candidates whose cause they espoused, but in reality they sought their own advantage and strengthened their own influence at the expense of the crown, which gradually lost its luster. The clergy, too, were eagerly reaching out for more prestige and power, and would gladly despoil the king of the authority and supervision which he had hitherto exercised in the church. This tendency became especially marked after the creation of the Norwegian archbishopric of Nidaros in 1152. In their efforts to despoil royalty of its power, we soon find the clergy firmly leagued with the aristocracy, and in time these two allied forces ruthlessly swept away the last vestige of real significance of the crown. With a young woman of a good family, Borghild of Dahl, King Sigurd had the illegitimate son Magnus, whom he caused to be proclaimed successor to the throne. King Eystein had only one child, a daughter, Maria, and as Magnus was Sigurd's only son, it was expected that he would become sole king without opposition. But two years before the death of Sigurd, a young man of Irish birth, Harald Gila, or Gilchrist, came to Norway, and claimed to be an illegitimate son of King Magnus Barefoot. Harald was tall and slender, with dark hair, and looked in all respects like an Irishman. He spoke the Norwegian language imperfectly, and never learned to speak it well. His whole career showed him to be a man of weak character and small ability. He asked King Sigurd to grant him permission to prove his royal extraction by ordeal, and after some deliberation Sigurd, strangely enough, granted this request, as he seems to have felt convinced that Harald was really his half-brother. Harald passed successfully through the ordeal of walking over red-hot plowshares, and Sigurd made him a member of his herd, and became quite attached to him, though he made him swear a solemn oath that he would never attempt to become king of Norway as long as Magnus lived. Magnus seems to have regarded Harald Gila as a rival, and felt intense hatred for him from the start. This was in itself natural enough, but Magnus's own vicious character aggravated the situation, and foreboded serious trouble. Though yet very young, he was avaricious, proud, quarrelsome, violent, and intemperate. This must have made it easy for the profligate but cheerful Harold Gilla to secure a large number of friends and followers. When Sigurd died, Magnus succeeded to the throne, but Harold, who was in Tunsberg at the time, assembled a thing there, and when it became apparent that he had as many adherents as Magnus, he was also proclaimed king in spite of the oath he had taken. Magnus was forced to give his consent, and the two became joint kings, each with his own herd. The first few years passed quietly, but it was evident from the start that peace could not long be maintained. In 1134 hostilities commenced. Magnus collected a large army, and Harald Gila crossed the Dover Mountains into Viken and Bohuslan, where he hoped to get support from his friend King Eric Amune of Denmark. But he was completely defeated by Magnus and fled to Denmark where he received the province of Holland as a fief from the Danish king. The short-sighted and arrogant Magnus would listen to no advice, and he took no precaution to guard his kingdom against attack. 
Howard Gille gathered a new army and received substantial aid from King Eirik Imune. He came to Norway the same year and quickly gained control of the southeastern districts where he had many friends. When he reached Bergen, Magnus was still busy trying to gather an army, but he had no force to put in the field against his rival. Harald took him prisoner, caused him to be maimed and blinded, and imprisoned him in a monastery at Niederholm near Trondheim. He was afterwards known as Magnus the Blind. The vicious Harald Gila pursued with innate cruelty the adherents of Magnus, killed, maimed, and blinded many of them to get possession of the royal treasures. He seized Bishop Reinald of Stavanger and hanged him, because he could not pay the sum of twelve marks of gold which Harald Gila demanded when the bishop could not reveal the place where King Magnus had hidden his treasures. To hang a bishop like a common thief was regarded as the vilest of crimes, but we hear of no bull of excommunication issued against Harald, though a provincial church council was assembled shortly afterwards. Harald Gila had indeed become king, but during his short reign he was a tool in the hands of his followers. He spent his treasures with lavish hands, and let his men do as they pleased. This gave him a certain popularity among the leaders, who felt that he was weak and pliant enough to leave them in actual control. During his inglorious reign the foundation was gradually laid for a rule of the aristocracy, through their most powerful representatives, the Lendermaind. Very little is known of Harald Gilla's reign. In 1135 the Wends appeared on the coast of Norway with a large fleet. They attacked the city of Konghella, but it is nowhere recorded that King Harald made an attempt to aid the city. The castle was besieged and taken, the church and king's residence were burned, the city was pillaged, and a large number of the inhabitants were carried into captivity. The prosperity of the town was destroyed, and it never regained its prestige. It became henceforth an ordinary trading place, as it probably had been before the days of Sigurd the Crusader. An event of some importance was the successful attempt of Kalle Kolsen, or Ragnvald Jarl, to get possession of the Orkneys. King Sigurd had granted Kalle one half of the Orkneys, and he gave him the name and title of Ragnvald Jarl, after Ragnvald Brusason, one of the most renowned of the Orkney Jarls. The grant seems to have been made for the purpose of uniting the islands more closely with Norway, since Jarl Paul, who ruled them at this time, sought to gain the friendship of the king of England, for the purpose, no doubt, of becoming able to throw off all allegiance to King Sigurd. When Magnus became king, he deprived Ragnvald both of his title and his possessions, but Harald Giller renewed the grant, and Ragnvald captured Jarl Paul, and made himself ruler over both the Shetland and Orkney groups. As he owed full allegiance to the king of Norway, the danger of a separation of these colonies from the mother country was averted. Harald Gilla had not been king very long when a new pretender appeared and claimed the right to share the throne with him. This was Sigurd Slamberiakin, who had also claimed to be a son of Magnus Barefoot. His mother, Thora, daughter of Saxa of Vik, was married to the priest Adelbrecht, and it does not appear with what show of right he called himself the son of King Magnus. He had been considered the son of Adelbrecht, and had been brought up for the church, but he began a life of adventure, visited the Holy Land, and engaged in trading expeditions to Ireland, Scotland, and the Orkneys. In Denmark he proved his paternity by ordeal, as Harald Gille himself had done in Norway, but when he presented himself before the king in Bergen, and asked him to recognize him as his brother, Harald refused. The leading men also refused to believe the story, though they were probably not troubled so much by the doubt of his veracity as by the fear that this gifted and resolute man might be able to exercise authority over them if he were allowed to ascend the throne. Sigurd was imprisoned and placed on trial for killing Thorkel Fostra, the son of Sormerlide, in the Orkneys, and it seems that Harald sought to rid himself of the inconvenient rival by having him secretly carried away at night and drowned. But Sigurd, who suspected the design, pushed two of the guards into the sea, jumped from the boat, and escaped to the mountains. For some time nothing was heard of him, but on the night of the 13th of December, 1136, he gained access with a few followers to the house where Harald Gila was sleeping after a drinking feast, and killed him in his bed. From the deck of a vessel in the harbor, Sigurd addressed the people of Bergen, as soon as day dawned, and asked them to accept him as their king, but they refused. They gathered in large numbers on the shore and proclaimed him an outlaw. 
Sigurd then left Bergen and went to Hordaland in southwestern Norway, where he was well received by the people. But Harald Gille's queen, Ingerid, hastened to Viken and assembled the Borgerthing, where her one-year-old son, Inge, was proclaimed king. In Trendelagen, the Urething assembled as soon as the people heard of Harald Gille's death, and his illegitimate son Sigurd, three years of age, was placed on the throne. He was later known as Sigurd Mund. When Sigurd Slembedjakin saw that he had no chance to gain the throne for himself, he resolved to take Magnus the Blind from the monastery and place him as a candidate. On a dark night, shortly after Christmas, in 1137, he landed at Niederholm, took Magnus from the monastery, and sailed southward along the coast to the mouth of the Romdalsfjord, where they parted. Magnus proceeded up the Romsdal Valley into Uplandene, where he spent the winter, and Sigurd set sail westward across the sea, hoping that he would be able to rally a strong party around the blind king. In this expectation he was not disappointed. The return of Magnus awakened once more the loyalty to the son of Sigurd the Crusader, and many of the chieftains joined him. But in Viken, Thjostov Olesson and other leaders, who were guarding King Inge, gathered an army, marched against King Magnus, and defeated him in a battle at Minne. Thjostov Olesson carried the child king, Inge, with him in the battle, and he was hurt so that he grew up to be a lame and crippled hunchback. In history he is usually called Inge Krokrig, hunchback. Magnus fled to Jarl Karl Sunnesen in Vestergotland and persuaded him to espouse his cause. The Jarl invaded Norway, but Thjostov Olesen and Almund Gerdsen met him at Krokoskog and defeated him. Magnus now fled to Erik Emune of Denmark and employed all his power of persuasion to stir this tyrannical and ambitious king to lead his forces against the Norwegian chieftains. He told him that the country was now ruled by children and that if he came with his whole army, no one would venture to raise a sword against him. King Eric found the moment favorable and the outlook tempting. He gathered a large fleet of 250 ships and sailed for Oslo, where Thjostov Olesen was stationed with a small garrison. Olesen retreated, bringing with him the shrine of St. Halvard. The St. Halvard church was destroyed by fire, and the city was sacked and burned. But the Lenderman soon met King Eric with large forces, and he was unable to make further progress. All his attempts were unsuccessful, and he lost a number of men. Finally, he returned to Denmark, deeply chagrined at his failure. The people's ill will against him had increased, and he was assassinated at the Ernehoverthing in Schleswig, shortly after his return. Erik Hawkinson, generally known as Erik Lam, was chosen his successor. Sigurd Slembedjakin, who had been in the Orkneys, returned too late to aid Magnus in his campaigns. When he reached Norway and heard of Magnus's defeat, he turned southward to Denmark, where King Eric Lamb allowed him to gather ships and warriors. His operations henceforth can scarcely be characterized as anything but piratic expeditions, carried on with great cleverness and daring, but leading to no definite results. He attempted to get a footing at Konghella, but was driven away by Thjost of Olesen. In another attempt at Porter, in Viken, he was equally unsuccessful. With seven ships he then made a descent on Leicester in southern Norway, and killed the lenderman bent in Kolbinsen, but the people soon drove him away, and he sailed northward to Bjarki, in Hologaland, where he was well received by Vidkun Jonsson, Magnus the Blind's foster father. In the spring of 1139 he again joined Magnus in Denmark, and the two gathered what forces they could find for a new attack on Norway. They had in all thirty ships, of which twelve were Norwegian, while eighteen were auxiliary Danish forces. The kings Inge and Sigurd sent twenty ships against them, and at Holmengra, near Bohuslen, the battle was fought on November 12, 1139. The Danes sailed away before the battle began, and Sigurd and Magnus were soon overpowered. Magnus fell, and Sigurd Slembediakin was captured and put to death in a most cruel manner. This terminated the first period of the civil wars, and the country enjoyed peace for a few years. The aristocracy, now secure in their power, had nothing to fear so long as the kings were young, but when they grew to manhood they might become more difficult to manage. Inge Krokrieg proved to be weak and tractable, but Sigurd Mund was a dissolute and violent youth. His first act when he became of age was to cause the assassination of Otter Berting, the leading man in Trindelagen. 
In order to further weaken the power and influence of the crown, the lenderman sought to create as many kings as possible. Six years after Sigurd and Inge had been placed on the throne, Eystein, an older brother of Harald Gula, came from Scotland with his mother, Beathak. Harald had told his men of this son, and no other evidence of his royal descent was demanded. He was speedily proclaimed king at the Urething in Trendelagen. Harald Gille had a fourth son, Magnus, who was reared by the old chieftain Kripping Urm of Stödle, and he was also proclaimed king, though he was a sickly cripple and did not live long. Norway had now four kings at the same time, and if this system of succession was to be followed, the kingdom might be blessed with four times four kings before another generation had passed. When we observe such a canker of weakness and decay eating at the very vitals of the state, we can understand the feelings of the old historian, Theodricus Monachus, when he cut short his Historiae de Antiquitate Regum Norwegiensium at the close of the reign of Sigurd the Crusader, and says that he will not record for posterity all the dastardly and lawless acts committed in the period which followed that reign. These struggles between rival candidates for the throne do not seem, however, to have disturbed the peace and contentment of the rank and file of the people. The armed conflicts were carried on by the kings, the pretenders, the greater chieftains, and their personal followers. That there was no general war can be seen from the small number of ships and men engaged even in the more serious encounters, as in the Battle of Homengra, where Sigurd and Magnus had only twelve small vessels, and the united forces of King Inga Krokrig and Sigurd Mund numbered only twenty ships. There is evidence that general prosperity and contentment prevailed, and that commerce was rapidly developing. The commercial towns of Vey in Romsdal, Skien, Skidan, in southern Norway, and Kaupang in Sogn sprang into existence, and the cities of Stavanger and Hamar also began their first real growth at this time. The Cistercian monastic order was introduced in Norway during this period, not from France, but from England. Two monasteries of this order were founded, the Lisa Monastery at Bergen, and the Hufedur Monastery at Oslo, Christiania. Also a cloister for nuns of the same order, the Nonaceter Cloister in Bergen. Lisa Monastery, which was founded by Bishop Sigurd of Bergen, July 10, 1146, was the first monastery of this order in Norway. The Havidur Monastery was founded May 18, 1147. The Nonaceter Cloister seems also to have been founded by Bishop Sigurd about the same time as the Lisa Monastery. End of chapter 56Chapter 57 of History of the Norwegian People, Volume 1, by Knut Gershit. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Inner Organization and Growth of the Church of Norway Among pagan nations, religion has always been regarded as an affair properly belonging within the domain of state administration. In pagan Norway, public worship was a state affair to such an extent that there was not even a distinct priesthood. The kings and chieftains performed the priestly functions of the temples, and as they were the leaders of the people in war and at the thing, they were also the custodians of the sanctuaries, and the wardens of the old faith. The feeling that the king was the highest authority in religious matters, as well as in affairs of government, grew out of the oldest traditions of the nation, and it was only intensified through the introduction of Christianity. The new faith was established by the kings themselves, who exercised full authority in all matters pertaining to the church and made laws governing its organization and future work. Christianity had become their special cause, in the opinion both of friends and opponents, a part of the new system which they sought to establish. When the aristocracy suffered defeat and the old political and religious opposition disappeared, the king became the head of the church as well as of the state, not only because of the power which he exercised and the organization which he had created, but also because the tradition and sentiment of the nation freely accorded him that position. Even after the Church of Norway was placed under the supervision of the Archbishop of Bremen, and later under the Archbishopric of Lund in Skana, which was created in 1104, the king continued to be its real head. King Harald Hordrada's answer to Archbishop Adalbert of Bremen, I know of no Archbishop in Norway except myself, King Harald is characteristic. 
and illustrates well the situation. The archbishop, who was far away and wholly unknown to the people, could exercise but a nominal authority. All real power was in the hands of the king. This gave the Church of Norway a somewhat unique position. The character of its organization was determined by the laws issued by the king, and its complete dependence on royal authority stood in sharp contrast to the supremacy of the Roman Catholic Church in other countries of Europe. The bishops were at first missionaries without fixed dioceses. They were chosen by the king and were called herd bishops, as they were regarded as belonging to the king's herd. They were his advisers in ecclesiastical affairs, but owed him the same obedience as other herdmen. The Heimskringla says of St. Olaf, The church laws he made according to the advice of Bishop Grimkel and other teachers, and he devoted all his energy to the eradication of paganism and old customs, which he considered contrary to the Christian spirit. The necessity of obtaining the consent of the people to the laws thus made constituted, however, an effective check on the royal authority. Even after permanent dioceses had been established, the choice of bishops was still controlled by the king. They were still dependent on him for their maintenance as well as for their office, and when they traveled through the country superintending the church work, they came as the king's representatives. The churches erected during the early Christian period were of three kinds. Each filke had one or more principal churches, filke's churches. These received grants of land from the king, and the people were also required to contribute to their support. In course of time, churches were also built in the herods, or local districts, and many of the leading men erected chapels, Hugendes churches, on their own estates. The priests of the filke's churches were chosen by the king and received an income, partly from the church lands, and partly in form of contributions and fees from their parishioners. The Herod priests were chosen by the people, and were wholly dependent on the parishioners for their salary. The priests in the Hergendes churches were appointed and paid by the owner of the church, or by the Filkes or Herod's priests whom they served as assistants. This very democratic church organization differed widely in character from the hierarchic system of the Church of Rome. The bishops exercised authority, each in his own diocese, but they were not leagued together in any higher unity. They were dependent on the king, as the priests were dependent on their parishioners, both for their office and their substance. The clergy were amenable to the state laws, like other citizens, as the church laws were only a part of the civil code. The church had no laws of its own, and exercised no separate jurisdiction. In social life, the priests and bishops were still bound closely to the rest of the people through intermarriage, as celibacy was not enforced in Norway till in the latter part of the 13th century. But in time, the influence of the Roman hierarchy, which dominated all intellectual and spiritual life of the age, made itself more strongly felt also in Norway. The religious enthusiasm aroused by the Crusaders inspired kings like Olaf Kyrre and Sigurd the Crusader with ardent devotion to the cause of the church, and they were easily persuaded to enlarge its privileges even at the expense of their own power. The spirit of the times, the zeal and ability of the popes, together with the conditions at home, gave the Church of Norway a hierarchic character, and made it an organization independent of the state, able to exert a controlling influence over state affairs. The religious fervor of the kings originated this new development. The introduction of the system of tithes in the reign of Sigurd the Crusader made the clergy independent economically, and the period of the civil wars hastened the growth of the power and independence of the church. The weak and worthless kings who occupied the throne in that period were as unfit as they were unable to exercise supreme control over religious affairs. In struggles with their rivals, they willingly bartered away powers and principles for temporary advantages. The royal power was weakened, and the government demoralized. In such a period of anarchy and commotion, the church would naturally assume control of its own affairs, not only because of opportunity, but as a matter of necessity. The chief step towards a hierarchic organization of the Church of Norway was the establishing of the Archdiocese of Nidaros in 1152, and the new regulations then made for the Norwegian Church. Cardinal Niklaus Breakspear of England was sent by Pope Eugenius III as papal legate with instructions to establish archbishoprics in Norway and Sweden, and he also brought with him the pall for the new archbishoprics. The Archdiocese of Nidaros should include the five bishoprics of Norway, and also the six bishoprics in the Norwegian colonies. 
Skullholt and Holar in Iceland, Kirkwall, Old Norse Kirkjuvalgur in the Orkneys, Gardar in Greenland, Kirkjubø, Old Norse Kirkjubø in the Faroe Islands, and the bishopric of the Hebrides, Sudriar and Man, Sodor and Man. New regulations were also made for the election of bishops in the five bishoprics of Norway proper. A chapter, or college of priests, was organized in each diocese. The members of this chapter, Canoniki, should constitute the bishop's council. They were also to perform the duties of his office in case of vacancy, and should elect his successor without interference from secular authorities. The archbishop was chosen by the chapter of the diocese of Nidaros, but he was consecrated by the pope and received the pall from him. The colonial diocese had no chapters, and their bishops were chosen by the chapter of the diocese of Nidaros. The tax called Peter's Pence was introduced, and each grown person should pay a penning to the church. Regulations were also made for disposing of property by testament, which had not hitherto been customary, and it must be inferred that the church hoped to profit by this arrangement. A person should have the right to give away by testament one-tenth of his inherited property and up to one-fourth of property which he himself had acquired. A woman might grant by will one-tenth of her dowry, and up to one-fourth of her one-third share of the property, which she held in joint ownership with her husband. Celibacy of the clergy was also established, but it was not yet enforced. The priests were to be appointed by the bishops, but it is not clear to what extent the bishops exercised this right. The Roman Church asserted everywhere its spiritual supremacy over the state, and claimed certain privileges and powers as its own indisputable right. The chief of these were the right of the church to legislate in all ecclesiastical matters, the church law consisting of the canonical code, supplemented by the decrees which the pope and the church councils might issue from time to time, should be independent of the civil law, and should govern all affairs pertaining to the church and the clergy. Separate ecclesiastical courts were to be established, and the church should exercise full jurisdiction in all cases involving religion, the church, and the clergy. The church was to enjoy freedom from any but voluntary contributions to the state. By the new regulations of 1152, these rights were established in theory, at least, and the bishops henceforth claimed them in the name of the church. But neither the kings nor the people were at first willing to grant the clergy such privileges. The claims remained for a while only the abstract principles of the spiritual supremacy of the church, and its independence of all secular authority. But the time came when the church arrayed itself against the state in an effort to enforce its claims, and we find the bishops themselves fanning the flames of civil strife. This new power, which had been nursed under the king's special care, allied itself, after 1152, with the reactionary aristocracy in opposition to the crown. The energies of the clergy were largely devoted to the perfecting of its outward organization, and to the incessant combats waged for new privileges and increased influence. The priests were often poorly qualified for their calling, worldliness grew, and more emphasis was laid on the outer form than on the inner spirit of Christian life and faith. As Christianity had been introduced by royal decree, as the knowledge even of the fundamentals of the Christian faith was more than imperfect, and the bishops and priests were often more intensely interested in politics and other temporal affairs than in the religious instruction of the people, Christianity was generally regarded as a new law which the king had proclaimed. The new faith became a sort of witch's cauldron in which the remnants of paganism, superstitions, and fragments of Christian belief were hopelessly mixed. In too many cases it could scarcely be called Christianity. The hierarchic organization of the church probably increased at first its efficiency as a moral agent. It could now act with great authority, and could display a power and splendor which made a strong impression on the popular mind. But its missionary spirit gradually gave way to love of wealth and power and the attention was gradually directed to the outward forms of the church service which could work no regeneration of spirit. The work of conversion was begun, but the Roman hierarchy showed itself unable to lead the people forward to full spiritual daylight. The religious and moral growth, so slow in Norway, was if possible even more behindhand in the colonies. Christianity was accepted as the state religion in Iceland in the year 1000, but the legislative act of the Althing which abolished the old worship produced no perceptible change in the moral life or the religious views of the people. 
the Christian church in Iceland was too poorly organized to become even a fair substitute for the old temples which were torn down. The churches were all built by influential chieftains, who often took holy orders and served as priests in their own churches, when no priests could be had. In this way, they could combine the priestly functions with their political and social leadership as in pagan times. If they found this arrangement inconvenient, they took boys into their homes and instructed them sufficiently so that they could read the church service and made them priests in their churches. These boys had no social standing, but were classed with the servants of the household. It is quite evident that under such circumstances Christianity could be but a thin varnish over a completely pagan life. The loss of the old faith and the lack of instruction in the new produced not immediately, but in due course of time, a religious indifference and general moral laxity which comes so prominently into the foreground in the bloody Stirling period, 1160 to 1262, a complete counterpart to the period of civil wars in Norway. In speaking of this period, Professor J. E. Sars says, In the so-called Stirling period, the country was more and more torn by the wildest party strife the final result of which was that the Icelandic people, exhausted, torn, and despairing, gave up their independence and threw themselves into the arms of the kingdom of Norway. The accounts of these feuds reveal a bloodthirstiness, hard-heartedness, and violent desire for wealth and power, which is not surpassed in pagan times, and furthermore a faithlessness and treachery, a lack of respect for law and justice, a licentiousness and a dissolution of domestic life, to which the saga period prior to 1030 furnishes no parallel. Conrad Maurer says of the Stirling period, The fearful disorders are ascribable in part to the political situation, but in part, and perhaps for the greater part, they are due to another circumstance, namely the change to the new faith, as paradoxical as this may sound. The more completely paganism as a thoroughly national religion had grown together with the whole life of the Norsemen, the more definitely and comprehensively it had embraced and shaped the people's moral and legal conceptions, the more grievous was the loss caused by abandoning it. On the other hand, the more outward the motives had been which had led the masses of the people to change their faith, the less the new faith, we must admit, was able to compensate for the loss. During the first decades after the introduction of Christianity, this misfortune would be less keenly felt, since on the one hand paganism still continued for a time to dominate the minds of the people, while on the other hand the glowing further and truly Christian conduct of the few who from a deep inner conviction professed the new faith won for Christianity, as far as their influence went, a powerful influence also over external life. But after the generation which had been brought up under paganism had passed away, and also their nearest descendants, who through lack of priests had been reared to a large extent in the pagan spirit, after Christianity, on the other hand, had become a custom, represented not by zealous neophytes, but by priests who were poorly trained, and who generally were so occupied with the outward forms of the new religion that they could pay but little attention to its inner contents, while their great political importance and their unfortunate social position turned their thoughts from their religious calling, the gap produced in the people's minds by the change of faith, outwardly accomplished but inwardly far from completed, showed itself in all its fearful significance. It is easily understood that the unrest caused by this sudden rupture of all existing conditions brought to the surface the worst elements of the people and the most objectionable traits of their natural character. It would be erroneous, however, to think that the blight thrown upon Christianity by these conditions was altogether general. Long before the introduction of the Christian faith, many of the most earnest and intelligent had ceased to believe in the old gods and were searching for new light. To many of them, Christianity must have come as glad tidings, and though their Christian knowledge was very imperfect, it must have chastened their spirit, and inspired them with new love for the goodness which is heaven-born. The new moral standards established by the Christian teaching could not long remain a secret to those who had dreamed of virtues which paganism did not know, and the force of their example, and their words of admonition and counsel, would not be lost on those who suffered from all the evils of a dark and lawless age. Through the tumult of the civil wars we hear nothing of these, but we are nevertheless sure that they were found, yes, that they were numerous, and that they were gradually bringing about a great change in the social, religious, and moral life of the nation. The effect of this new spiritual and moral leaven is shown among other things by the disappearance of slavery. It happened even in pagan times that a man would grant a slave his liberty on certain conditions, 
especially if the slave had done him some great service, or the slave might buy his freedom. But new ones were constantly bought in the numerous slave markets. But with the advent of Christianity, the slave markets were gradually closed. In the old laws, usually called the laws of St. Olaf, it was enacted that at the meeting of every log thing a slave should be given his freedom, to the honor of God, and the remuneration given the owner should be paid by the whole logderma. In Olaf Kyrr's time, this law was so amended that each Vilkis thing should liberate a slave every year. This had a great influence on public opinion, and in the twelfth century, before the civil wars were ended, slavery had ceased to exist in Norway. Although religious life made slow progress during the period of storm and stress caused to some degree by the change of faith, a new cultural life, born in part of the new spirit, was growing, budding, and giving promise of the great intellectual awakening, the luxuriant unfolding of literature, art, and national greatness in the period that followed. An age of almost unparalleled productivity which in a hundred years gave Norway and Iceland the great old Norse literature, which saw great cathedrals erected, science and learning cultivated, and Norway, politically strong and economically prosperous, highly honored among the states of Europe. Such conditions could not be produced suddenly, as if by accident, but followed as a result of a development which, though obscured and retarded, was not interrupted by the tumultuous feuds of the civil wars, and which gives even that period a tinge of hopefulness and a touch of wayward charm. The period which was marred by so much domestic turmoil showed marked signs of an awakening of literary activity. The books were usually written in Latin, which was the literary language elsewhere in Europe. The Mass, which was the most important part of the church service, was also conducted in that language, but the custom of preaching to the people in their own tongue had been introduced from England by the first missionaries in the time of Olaf Tryggvason and Olaf the Saint, and homilies were written in Old Norse to be read in the churches. The legends about the Norwegian saints were also embodied in writing. The oldest St. Olaf legend was written in Latin about 1140. It seems to have been composed by a priest in Trondheim to be read to pilgrims and visitors on St. Olaf's Day, and it was soon followed by a whole literature of similar character. Einar Skulason's poem, Geisli, a draupa written about St. Olaf, which the poet recited in the Christ Church in Trondheim in 1153, was also based on this legend. The most important literary work of the period was the embodiment in writing of the old laws of Norway in the great codes, the Frosta things love, Gula things love, Eidsiva things love, and Borger things love. These codes, together with the Bjarkiarethr, or municipal laws, the Hilskral, and other old laws, were all written in the Old Norse language. The time when they were written can be determined only approximately from internal evidence from the codes themselves as the sources contain no direct statement with regard to it. The old writers regarded it as certain that the old laws were first written by St. Olaf himself. Theodricus Monachus says of Olaf, Leges patria lingua conscribi fecit, and the Legenda de Sto Olavo says, Leges divinis et humana scripsit et promulgavit, Saxo Grammaticus holds the same opinion, but Conrad Maurer has shown that this opinion has nothing to support it except St. Olaf's great reputation as lawgiver, while the wording of the codes themselves proves that they could not have been written by him or under his direction. Ebbe Hertzberg finds that the church laws, Christenret, which form a supplement to all these codes, were written before the system of tithes was introduced by Sigurd the Crusader, 1111-1120 and as the other laws must have been written as soon as possible after the task was once begun, the whole work was probably finished in Olaf Kyrre's reign, prior to 1111. End of chapter 57